So I try and go for like a suave approach. Hello, good evening, and you're with Lee Taylor, author of the book Bound. With me tonight is my co-host, as well as brethren, my brother from another mother, J.T. Harding. Also joining us is our special guest, Roy Hudson. How are you, sir? I am good. How are you? I'm over doing the weird voice thing. That was really quite, that kind of stressed me out. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you talk hey. to I took you. I took right. you from you. Yeah. Oh well, I'm the I'm the author of Uber's new horror sensation, sweeping the world, and available in paperback at a bookstore near you on this Halloween. And while we're talking, um, I've got a friend that wants to say hello. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful words from Jay's pussy. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> I've got all kinds of sounds tonight. <laughs> um, I've got, we got Roy Hudson. He's the author of Relic, uh, soon to come out November 1st. Um, uh, the Odic Touch, soon to come out again soon. Um, author of 13 Tales of the, no, wait, 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 you're not the author of the whole 13 Tales of the Pair. One of them. One of the 13 Tales, The Walk of Initiation. And the thorn, the thorn of death, uh, no more, no, uh, the, the story, no more room in hell. And, uh, wh- what is the, uh, Halloween Tales? Of course. Yeah. That's another one of your books. And that's perfect for this time of year. Okay. Um, so, Lee, what questions have you prepared for the man tonight? What questions have I prepared? <laughs> I've, I've lost my email them all to you. <laughs> 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 well, how are you doing tonight, Roy? I'm good. How about you? Fantastic, fantastic. Um, we want to talk about uh, all the good stuff that's going on in your life right now. But first of all, I'm going to ask you: Have you ever heard of someone by the name of Darren Brown? Doesn't ring a bell. <laughs> Um, you can, uh, uh, Lee, Lee, you, you, you're his, uh, I'm his fanboy. You're Darren Brown's bitch, so you go ahead and talk. Hells yeah, yeah. Not that I have a choice. I mean, basically, Darren Brown is like a street performer slash mathematician slash evil genius. He's, uh, he, he can like do all these hypnotism tricks and he's d- uh, awesome at predicting stuff and like, he, it's like he's got a master in psychology in which case he knows how the human mind thinks and he, from it he can predetermine like a set number of events in which case this person will take. Even when it's completely bizarre odds, like, uh, one of the tests he did, he had, like, there were these college students walk into a room and in this room there was like, um, a hundred paper cups. And under all these, like, hundred paper cups, there's, uh, there was, like, one with a nail in it, and there's one with a mouse in it. And if he got the, if he put his foot on the nail with the, well, if, if he put his foot on the nail, he got, like, 50,000 pounds. And, uh, if he put his foot, and he just had to get, like, crack 98 of these things or something. And, again, if he did it without hitting any, it was really bizarre anyway. So he goes all the way through and he predicted, like, which ones the guy wouldn't stand on to the point where it came down to, like, the last two, and just as he was, like, about to stand on the nail, um, he he decided to go for a different cup, and then Darren comes in, and, he, like, the guy's like, well, obviously, you're, you're lying, you know, there isn't a mouse underneath any of these cups, there isn't a nail, you just did it the trick, man, you know, and Darren's like, right, well, you know, this is the one you were about to stand on, he pulls it up, and lo and behold, there's, like, a nail sticking up. <laughs> and it was like a six inch now. He's absolutely fantastic. The things he does and the things he makes other people do, like uh, subliminal messaging. Um, there was even a show, a live show, like I think it was last year or the year before, in which case, like, he was basically playing a message through the television set, which, if you listen to it, there's a chance that you could go into a trance yourself whilst watching. And uh, t- at the end of the episode, it like had a like a degaussing thing, in which case it like took you out of whatever trance you were fitted into, and it was just absolutely remarkable. I mean, at the moment he's on TV and he's doing this apocalypse thing, in which case he's convincing this poor guy that it's the end of the world, and that it's it's quite an elaborate skit. So I'm not quite sure how it's going to end, other than this guy being paranoid and possibly taking his own life. 
As oh, so you're, wa- you're watching it on TV right now, right? Well, well I said it to record. I'm not, I don't want to watch it, otherwise I'll just be like, you'll be asking questions, and I'll be like, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's like most of our conversations are. So, um, sorry, what was that? I was watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Yesterday we were talking on Skype, and I'm just sitting listening to you, and you're laughing your ass off about something you're watching on TV. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Last night I was watching the Jonathan Wass show. Yeah. Which was, uh, and then after an hour and a half, you're like, oh, maybe I should turn this off. It's kind of rude, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, then I, I thought. The <laughs> and out came the good stuff. Let's get weird in here. Yes. Roy, how are you doing, my friend? I'm good. I don't watch a lot of TV, which is probably why I haven't heard of this guy. That's a shame. You ch- if you get a chance, check him out on YouTube or something. Just like a quick little five-minute video. If it, if he can't convince you to watch it, then uh, he's not for you. But he's brilliant. Uh, All right. But yeah, I saw I saw him on a special once where, um, like I was just talking about earlier uh, with you, Lee, he was he was in the upstairs apartment and looking out over a uh, uh, pedestrian scene. And uh, I'm not sure exactly how this went down, but he told this woman. He said that you have. He told her she had the power to make people do what she wanted. And he said, uh, pick somebody and then right at the correct moment, tell them to stop. And she's like, well, okay. And she said, stop. And this woman stopped right in the middle. And this is like a block away. Um, and she, and he said, uh, tell her to turn around. And she said, turn around. And the woman turned around and, uh, um, you you said that they interviewed the woman. Down yeah, the ba- basically they had, they had a brief interview afterwards where they like catch up to the woman and they also they have to ask her permission to be shown on TV. And uh, they're like, "Were you aware that you were being, you know, like influenced anyway?" And like, "Why did you turn around?" And she's like, "Well, I turned around because I thought I forgot something, you know." And they're like, "Okay, brilliant, carry on." And that was another thing that he would do is he would take um, paper that was cut out into the size of uh, bills. And he would go into a store and buy something and then hand over the blank piece, say, here's a $10 bill. And the guy would, like, give him change for a blank piece of paper and his in whatever he ordered. Uh, I saw that in Firestarter. Uh, David D- David Keith had the ability to do that in the movie Firestarter and in the Stephen King novel. So there, there have been fictional cases of that. Oh, yeah. And now there's actual cases of it. Because this guy, this guy actually did it. Uh, yeah, I, I personally think that Darren Brown was the guy that uh, was responsible for making David Blaine believe he has a magic eye in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's like, yeah, if anyone asks, your hand is magic. And David Blaine's like, yeah, okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, as far as I know, David Blaine's the only guy that's been able to levitate atop the... Uh, the Great Pyramid in Las Vegas. I mean, I don't know. That to me is pretty big. David well, Blaine. I, I, I think know. he ever tried. I think he rocks. I've, I've I? twice. I, no, not me. <laughs> I keep falling. I get halfway up. I fall down. <laughs> yeah, no. For me, if it's if it's a magician, it has to be Dynamo. He's he's a British guy. I mean, you know, like uh, like some of the old tricks David Blaine used to do, where he'd be like pulling up a card, like it would appear inside a window, and they're scratching it and they're saying, "Wow, that's incredible." Well, Dynamo's kind of upped his ante by uh, not only dis- disappearing in public, just like in the middle of a shopping centre, which is really quite incredible itself, but he, was, he can, like, he, like superheat his body, or at least that's how it appears, so he can, like, melt his hand through glass or into glass. And again, it's not staged glass. He's, like, been invited to go to a place or whatever, and he just turns up. And they're like, you know, pick a cabinet. And he's like, well, well that, that cabinet over there with the shoes in. So he walks over to this cabinet and just puts his palm on the glass and just begins to, like, you can see steam coming up. And you're like, well, what the hell's going on? All you can see is him pressing his hand against the glass. And then he pulls it away and you can see, like, the perfect indentation of where he's, like, melted his hand into the glass. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Flash can do that too. <laughs> well, there you go. But that's another fictional character. It's true. So uh, yeah. it's kind of hard to argue with a fictional character, though. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think it's quite easy because I mean, you can just write fan fiction about them. 
<laughs> so when you say uh, the Flash, do you are you talking about like Wally West or like there was like other versions of him as well, wasn't there? Yeah, there there were several Flashes. Uh, the one that I'm most familiar with though is Barry. Uh, oh, Bar- what Barry West? Is that oh, what's his name? Uh, Barry, oh, Barry Allen. Oh, Barry Allen. Okay, not Barry Manlow. That's a shame. He would have made an awesome Flash. I guess. <laughs> I knew a guy that I knew a guy that flashed across a football stadium a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah, I think his name was Barry too. <laughs> so, Roy, what? Um, tell us about Relic. Um, I've got the, I've got the usual blurb here about uh, uh, an actor by the name of R. L. Simmons, uh, and it, is this is this about? Um, is it like a romantic comedy or is it uh, a drama yeah. or? There's romance to it, but it's more of a thriller, really. Okay. It says something about uh, um, an accident disfigures him, and uh, he feels his life is over. Uh, yeah. And then all of a sudden there's a stalker with a score to settle. Uh, I, I hate that when stalkers come around. You know, you owe me $5. <laughs> but, I'm really a damper on your day, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of Stalker, um, Lee, I don't know if we want to get put the cat out of the bag, but Lee and I have been talking about uh, collaborating on a new story about a serial killer. Lee, um, um, Joe Rubis uh, and I first conceived of this, and, uh, and uh, so and I was left uh, holding the bag. So now I hand half the bag over to Lee. Uh, the idea of a serial killer being stalked um, by someone who is extremely depraved. Um, I think that would be a great idea. Lee told me that um, the first season of Dexter um, had something similar to that. Have you seen Dexter, Roy? No, but I'm familiar with the concept. What what about a serial killer being stalked? Uh, serial killer stalking and killing other serial killers. Uh, he works for the cops. I'm familiar with the the basic gist of Dexter, but I but I'm haven't watched it. Oh, okay. Well, Lee, I guess that's up your alley then. Yes, I like the television series Dexter. I also read the uh, Jeff Lindsay's books. To be fair, first because I was like, well, you know, if I'm going to start watching a TV series, I don't want to go into it half cocked you got to be fully committed to this kind of thing, and so it's the polite thing to do. I mean, the only thing I struggled to do with when watching a TV series, reading the books with, was, uh, first of all, The Vampire Diaries. The uh, first few books of that kind of, uh, how should I say it, got on my tits. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, no, no, not in a good way either. Not in a, hey, you bought me drinks, get on my tits, in the kind of way it's like, you know, you're annoying me. Um... Another book, uh, the Charlene Harris books weren't too bad actually, although I like, I preferred where the uh, storyline was going with the uh, books more than the TV series. But that's one of the rare examples. Uh, but in regards to Dexter, yeah, no, it was absolutely remarkable the way that everything was done. Um, the way it was all set up and Michael C. Hall being who he is, it's just, he's, I think he's, I think he's the perfect Dexter in all fairness. It's just the way he gets his emotions across or lack of. Have um, you guys seen the uh, TV show Heroes? Uh, yes, with uh, not Peter Vassanelli. That's a dude in Twilight. Uh, <laughs> yes, I've seen Heroes. Um, uh, you know, um, Siler was like the perfect bad guy. I mean, he was... Uh, uh, Roy, have you seen... Did you see Heroes? I, I know you did, didn't you? I know who you're talking about. Uh, Zachary Quinto. Yep, that's the one. Yeah. He was the perfect bad guy. I mean, he he could if he killed somebody. Now, ha, ha, when he got in, you know, like sliced into their brain, I don't know what happened. If just opening their brain up, or if he had to eat it, or whatnot. But somehow, um, he would get the other person's um, ability. Yeah. Well, basically, it, with Siler, because he had the ability to, uh, in effect, see how everything works, he could see like where the ability stems from. In which case, if he consumed it himself. He could absorb said ability. I mean, it shows the episode 
where it goes most graphic. I think it was like season three or season four, episode one, where he actually tracks down the cheerleader and he cuts her head open and he delves into her mind and like takes the ability for himself. But at the same time, she heals, in which case she gets the, um, obviously she's still alive after it's done. And she's like, well, aren't you going to kill me? And he's like, I don't need to. And it's just like, but she, but she doesn't feel pain after that, though, right? Yeah, no, she gets she gets pretty numb. She gets a bit emo for a while. Yeah, exactly, exactly. A fate worse than death. What being emo? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, if you ask them, I'm sure they'd agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't want to live anymore. I think the most famous emo that I can think of, and here I'm. 478 years old, but the most famous emo that I can think of um, was um, the guy that was uh, on YouTube that was, leave Britney alone! I, I, would, yeah, I, I wouldn't say it was emo, I would say it was definitely chemically unbalanced. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. I always thought emo was someone who really had no emotions except just like utter dejection, depression, you know. Um... But uh and and they overreacted. Uh doesn't an emo like overreact to everything? Is it an emo is? Well, <laughs> uh several different definitions I'd go for. Um I, I suppose some of them some of them could say that. Uh but to me like when I think of an emo I think of it's it's less of a uh, state of mind and more of a life choice. You know, they just they just decide that everything's so freaking difficult. Uh I've got all these emotions, but nobody cares. I'm all on my own. Well, no, you're not alone. Oh, I am. I mean, you don't know the darkness that's within me. What, you, what darkness? No, 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 not the normal darkness. Well, everyone has darkness, I suppose. No, 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 not normal darkness. This is really dark, really darkness. I mean, I'm, I'm all alone. You're not alone. I mean, there's other people out there that feel exactly the same as you. No, 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 I feel completely different. I'm an individual. Okay, you're an individual, yes. I like that T-shirt that says... Uh, I wish my grass was emo, so it would cut itself. Cut itself, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah right. That was. Um, I've always, I've always wanted to say this to an emo. Why so serious? <laughs> Why so serious? <laughs> you gotta love it. I got one of my Facebook friends today. He posted. He's, uh, he lives up in Michigan, and he says, I moved to Knoxville, Tennessee, because I'm tired of people telling me what to do and what not to do. And I was just so tempted to, to, to like, put on that timeline. He says, uh, well, then stay there. Do not leave. Do not move <laughs> to another city. And I, I thought, no, I'll get yelled at. Yeah, well, you, you, you could have messaged him and said, why don't you reply to this post? <laughs> and see what happens then. But to be honest, I'd, I'd like to see what would happen if you locked a hipster in a room with an emo within a single knife. Because I'm pretty sure that a hipster would cut himself before the emo just so they could say they did it first. <laughs> <laughs> that would wait. Now wait a minute. Now a hipster. I, I don't know what a hipster is, but what it used to be back in the '60s and '70s was somebody that was really cool. Uh, I'm a hipster. Um, they listened to all the best music, and uh, they had smoked all the best weed, and you know they were, yeah, they were right was, on the cutting edge. That was the '60s. Translated into modern yeah. times now, you have the same personalities, but in a younger generation of people deciding that they discovered everything first. It's like, oh no, no, no! You're drinking that beer wrong. You got to drink beer like this. No, 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 no! That's not a joint. You got to make it. You got to make it this way. And it's like, what you, it's a tampon. What are you doing? Okay, the difference is nowadays hipsters think that they're the cool ones. Exactly. But they're exactly. Like, they're just a bunch of bitches. <laughs> exactly. Oh, okay, okay. Or egotistical bitches, actually. <laughs> Well, Roy, I want to ask you um, about Odic Touch. Uh, what's the what's the history behind Odic Touch? I know it's about psychic vampires, but I know it's not even out right now. But it it is uh, hopefully to be out here soon. First of all, right? Yeah, soon. Hopefully. Okay. And uh, you talk about psychic vampires, um, and, and that really intrigued me because I believe personally, I believe that there are such beings in the world, and they're not necessarily uh, uh, the undead, 
although they probably wish they were. I, I wonder if an emo isn't a psychic vampire. But um, I, I had – absolutely. But uh, my definition of a psychic vampire is a person who robs another person's energies from them using such things. Mothers are good at this, using guilt, um, uh, <laughs> um, going through – um, m- making other people feel obligated in a certain way, um, or or just being overall uh, uh, overall mooches, um, or, but in other words, just sucking the life force. I mean, I had a, I had a girlfriend like that one time, but sucking the very life force out of you. Um, what the what's a psychic vampire in your world, Roy? Well, uh, I read about the concept in. Uh, a book called uh, Vampires, the Occult Truth by uh, Constantinos, and he describes something like that, but instead of using guilt or, you know, feelings on that level, uh, it's uh, stealing energy through uh, touch or through the astral plane where you physically leave your body and uh, go out to heal yourself using others' energy, stuff like that. Oh, okay, okay. You know, while you were talking, it reminded me of uh, uh, that girlfriend I was mentioning, how um, I every, every time we had sex, I would just be real weak afterwards. And I thought, <laughs> after a while, I was like, this was like every day. After a while, I just got tired of it. And I'm like, I think she's, I think she is like draining my energies. So um, I started like turning on my friends to her, you know, like, hey, check her out. You know, take her out for a date or something. You know um, who that th- reminds me of, Jay? That reminds me of General Jack Ripner from Dr. Strangelove. You have to keep the males pure. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about the bodily fluids? Yes, the bodily fluids. You don't want yes. this in your bodily fluids. D- Lee, did you see Dr. Strangelove? Uh, I did, but I was very young, and I can't remember any of it. All I can remember is oh. riding the A-bomb. This guy was just... Uh, this general was just so crazy. He's talking about, you can't let them take your bodily fluids. They're precious. You know, and you could just yeah. tell he was totally loony about that. But, but yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, sometimes you get uh, an over-exuberant uh, sex partner, and uh, uh, especially when you get older, after, you know, three times a month. I mean, after that, it's like, please, go somewhere else. But... Uh, <laughs> But, you know, when you're 17 years old, it's like, oh, I did it 15 times in one day. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, after, after a while, you start, you start noticing that uh, um, uh, when you ejaculate, it's, it's turning into be like nothing but plasma and, uh, you know, <laughs> just uh, salt water or whatever it is that's in your body. Um, but, anyway, I don't know how I got off on that subject. I gave up sex for Lent. Two years. <laughs> but um, but yeah, psychic vampires. Now, um, in the Odic touch, this is what your psychic vampires do: is they actually touch somebody and drain their life force from them. Yeah, but usually not in a negative way. They're they're right. the protagonists of the story, but there are some that are worse than others. So they suck life force out of you, but not in a bad way. To heal themselves, yeah. Oh, to to heal themselves. Oh, okay. All right. And that's uh, somehow not altruistic, I get the feeling. Well. Do they get permission first? Do you mind if I... (laughs) Not exactly. It's not something that one would want to knowingly give permission for. I don't think. Oh, okay. Well, you know, there's a whole genre of uh, people out there now using the word genre. I like that word, genre. It's almost <laughs> French. Um, but um, there's uh, there are people today that uh, their you know what they do, their social standing is a vampire, and they actually have people who follow them around that let them drink their blood. Um, and as, as strange as that sounds. Um, there are act, there is actually a medical condition in which a person um, creates too many red blood cells and they have to get drained off from time to time. I've met people like that with this condition, 
And sometimes these people... Leeches. What's that? Leeches? Oh, well, yeah. Leeches. That, that reminds me of that same girlfriend. But um, <laughs> um, No, but these people, sometimes these, these type of people, um, they, uh, they fall into uh, a relationship with one of these people that drink blood, these blood drinkers. And uh, uh, that's, that's pretty bizarre. That's pretty out there. Um, have you heard of that before, Lee? Uh, I've heard of similar things um, of where people have been like so obsessed with a person who they believe is a vampire that they're willing to do anything for them, and they offer themselves up as a well, as like a as a willing donor or a blood whore. Or uh, in more <laughs> recent media, um, the popular name now is Fangbanger. <laughs> <laughs> Fangbanger. Yeah. God, that sounds like a great name for a book. <laughs> or a rock band well I suppose so but I mean it, it depends I mean translated into English it, it means like teeth sausage I don't think it'd have quite the same like effect you know <laughs> I've always thought that um, toxic toxic waste would be a good name for a group but yeah. I don't know if anyone's ever come up with that so. probably back in like the 1980s when the toxic avenger was a big deal but I'm not. I'm not quite sure now. Now it's all. It'll be something like geopolitical name, like I don't know, uh, Hitler's nemesis or something. That'll be the next big band. All right. Uh, everybody. Everybody compares everybody else to Hitler now. I mean, that's so last century. Okay. You know, like, okay. What about? Oh, he's like Hitler. Who's the Who's the new guy now? I mean, oh, he's he's just like Saddam Hussein. Oh, that's not bad. Wait a minute. Well, how long until there's a band out there called Obama's Lamas or something? <laughs> Obama's Lama? Uh, or Obama's Lamas. Yeah. As in the animal. Hey, that would... Uh, I bet if if Obama were to buy a llama, that would be Obama's Lama. That would be. Or if Obama married Mario Lama, he would be <laughs> Obama Lama. <laughs> Unless it was Obama's mama's llama, uh-huh. uh, and, and if they were Islama, it would, please somebody stop. It would cause quite a drama. I'm going down. <laughs> I'm going down in flames. <laughs> yeah, you're dying. You're dying out there. <laughs> oh, um, Roy! Whenever you hear like two seconds of silence, you're supposed to like say something. So, oh, oh this is your. This year, well, or if you hear this sound, that's where we all take our clothes off, start yeah. dancing. <laughs> I was going to say, it's time <laughs> to party. Um, right, Roy, well, I've heard that you're a fan of anime. Uh, which was the first anime you're introduced to? Uh, not so much anime. I like graphic novels and comic books. Uh, some animation, like... Uh, in the 90s, Batman, the animated series. Uh, some of the newer movies, animated movies, like... Uh, what's the one I saw recently? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. That is not a bathroom sound I'm hearing. <laughs> I hope not. Dear God, dear God, that's not... He's I, touching it, himself while we're was someone Was <laughs> someone throwing up in the background, or... That was, was the dog. It was the dog. Yeah, blame me. it on the dog. Blame it on the dog. <laughs> Jay blames it on cats. You blame it on the dogs. I've got nothing to blame on. My kids are asleep. Oh, that's <laughs> right. No, Roy, have you heard of uh, Elf Quest? I've heard of it, but uh, that's about it. That was kind of like one of the first graphic novels out there. It was like you know, 10, 15 years ago. Leah, did you hear about it? Nope, I don't believe so. Okay, never mind. We'll move on. You can cut that part out of it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. No, Elf, Elf, Elf Quest was uh, basically that's what it was. It was about these, uh, it was a really good artist. I know nothing about it. We can Google it later and find out. But um, actually, yeah, that's why God made Wikipedia, didn't he? Um, he did. Elf, Elf Quest kind of like started the whole graphic novel um, um, phenom. All right, let's go here to ElfQuest. E O Q U E S. All right, ElfQuest, and it says that uh, 
What a time for the... Oh, okay. Uh, is a cult hit comic book properly created by Wendy and Richard Peeney. <laughs> what a name, Peeney. It's a fantasy story about a community of elves and other fictional species who struggle to survive and coexist in a primitive Earth-like planet with two moons. Uh, this came out in 1978. So, I guess that would be kind of the first one. But, uh, well, no, since neither one of you it, about it, I guess. It's technically it's, speaking, like, graphic novels, they go all the way back to, like, uh, Captain America, don't they? And before then, Superman. Oh, see, Batman. I, I, I don't, I, I don't know anything about it, therefore it must not exist, so. <laughs> yeah. Before 1980, <laughs> there was nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm the same type of person where I, I, uh, I doubt the existence of Europe until I actually go there, you know. Um, <laughs> when I, I doubted that there was really a Puerto Rico, and then when I got off the plane, it was like, holy shit, I was wrong. There is one. Um, Are you from so, Missouri, Jay? Missouri? No, no, no. But if I were, I'd say Missouri. I wouldn't say Missouri. Oh, okay. Because um, Missouri is a book by Stephen King. It was a fairly good book. Any writer should be scared. Uh, to have something to do with misery. Well, I don't know. I thought James Cand in, in the movie adaptation, I thought James Cand did a good um, job of it. And who was the other one? Oh, I want to say Bette Midler. Was she the, uh, yeah. was she the crazy one? Cassie Bates. That's a, Cassie Bette Bates. Bates. This was, this was kind of like her breakout role. Um, she, she did crazy really well yeah. in this one. Even though I think she could have done a better job, um, because uh, the uh, number one fan in the book, she, um, a lot of times she used the word cock a um because she didn't want to cuss until the very end when she was getting killed. And she was using every word you could think of. But um, in, in the movie, uh, I guess the ratings, they had to be a certain thing. She said cock a one time. You know, and I thought, wow, that's what a waste of a cock a um, You know, <laughs> she, she could have said it at least seven or eight times. Well, to be honest, she um, she she very well might have, but they might have decided, no, 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 she can't say cock a because it sounds like Willy Poo. It doesn't, it doesn't, it won't translate well to our audience. So let's just leave it in there once, and we'll cut the rest out. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, it did it did work that one time, but I think it could work more. But you know, we're splitting cock a hairs now, right? Talking that but um <laughs> but that uh arguably is one of uh the best movies that were adapted from stephen king's stories i know uh joe absolutely loves the stand um i thought stand was all right at in its time but now looking back uh 25 years later it's like wow how did we even how, how could we even believe in that shit you know um um, but, uh, but but you can see its influence where it's reached everything else, like so many other things, like so many different ideas. They're like, yeah, you know what? That was actually a good idea. Let's uh, let's go with that, but let's change the recipe a little bit. Let's uh, do some recycling. I mean, it's it's good for nature, so it should be good for my bank. But we'll see. Um, but like, obviously, you can see like the stand's influence. I think George Romero uh, admitted to uh, being influenced by the stand, like the whole apocalyptic feel of things. And so he was like George Romero. Yeah, and so he was like, uh, you know, zombie apocalypses. Suddenly, they became a real big deal. Uh, you can also see influences reaching out into, uh, well, to be honest, loads of different novels that have spun off since then. Um, some people were saying that The Road was obviously could be another example, or a Book of Eli, another example. But either way, it's, it's the same sort of thing. It's an apocalyptic vision of the future. Only uh, different circumstances brought them about. One of them, it was like intense heat. The other one, I, I, I'm not sure what it was, just like the general collapse of humanity. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember because I never actually read the uh, book, The Road. Who was the guy that wrote that? Cormac McCarthy, I think. That's it. That's the one, yeah. Cormac McCarthy. Oh, my mind's not worth it today. It's slightly... Yeah, that's uh, all right. Welcome to humanity. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's nothing. It's nothing. Uh, 
or paraphernalic related. But, uh, yeah, no, I mean, even like the <laughs> different TV series, um, Revolution or Revolution, uh, that could easily, people could say that was easily influenced by them, again, because it's the whole personal apocalyptic feel. Because, I mean, before that, there wasn't really that, they didn't really go into that much thought, but I think Stephen King did it to such a point where people like, you know, holy shit, this could happen. And uh, so, I mean, you just see, like, loads of different scenarios where they'll still, the setup will be similar, and then it will all come falling down, and there'll be accounts going on at the time, like uh, Max Brooks' book, World War Z, that's, like, following the, uh, well, it's, it's, it's like an interviewed account at the end of the apocalypse, but uh, it also contains, like, like, interviewed questions of people during the apocalypse in different stages. Like, uh, the initial breakout, uh, first signs, uh, what was happening during and what was happening after with all these different, uh, interviewed characters. And it was really quite a remarkable read. Uh, uh, I, had, uh, I had the audio book of World War Z and it's a dramatization where, uh, Max Brooks is the interviewer yeah. and uh, a whole cast of actors portraying the uh, people that he interviews in the book. It was really well done. Yeah, I, I hear that um, like with all the different interviewed people that they actually, like, all the voice actors did a pretty good job of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I thought did. it was, a, I thought that whole thing was a scam. I saw a, a movie trailer for one and it was just a, cl- it was a collection of clips from other movies. Well, if it was a trailer that you saw online, then it probably was. Oh, okay. <laughs> there, there are okay. people doing that. Man, like, trailer, yeah. yeah. But, um, I saw one that was um, before Dragon Ball Evolution uh, came out with uh, Justin Chatwin and James Masters as Piccolo. Uh, James Masters, who also did the voice for Harry Dresden in the audiobooks, which he did a really good job. Anyway, um, no, before Dragon Ball Evolution, they were showing like uh, fan-made trailers and saying, you know, the Saiyans are coming, and people were like, oh my god, it's going to be amazing. And they're like, wow, this is a really good trailer. And I'm like, hang on a second, I've seen that before. And it turned out that this fan basically had been taking images from like Smallville with crashing meteorites with kryptonite in it. <laughs> and uh, he was saying that that was like the Saiyan capsules coming in for landing. Uh, uh, but, uh, well, yeah. I, I, I don't want you guys to get the impression that Stephen King's did something unique here. Um, what he's done, is, and he did it very well, but what he did is he um, obeyed the uh, steps of the hero's journey. Do you all know what that is? Epic, the, yeah, like Beowulf and uh, the epic heroes such as Odysseus. Uh, yeah, he, he really followed in the epic tradition, only instead of using poetry, he did it in a massive uh, spanning novel that covers several characters. I thought that, you know, he took the idea of the classic epic and did wonderful things with it. Right. Um, there's actually a t- There's actually an arc to the hero's journey and it's it's kind of a mythological thing I mean, you can place it in any kind of genre you want there's that word again genre ooh um, uh, there's the, there's the call of, there's a call to adventure um, and it's usually someone who's kind of reluctant uh, to be the hero uh, they've received some sort of super, supernatural aid whether it's dreams or something happens to them um, and then there's uh, the threshold or the beginning of transformation where they begin having all these things happening to them on their journey. Uh, they uh, Sometimes they get a helper. Sometimes they get a mentor. Uh, there are challenges and temptations. Um, and uh, when things are the roughest again, um, uh, when it gets really, really bad again, something will pull them out of the fire. And then there's uh, the revelation as part of the hero's journey where they actually kind of go into the abyss uh, uh, and there's a death and rebirth uh, psychologically that happens and then with that there's a transformation um, then uh, an atonement uh, and usually the uh, there's a gift from some supernatural aid again uh, and then they return back to normal and that's kind of that's kind of like the hero's journey in a big circle, um, and uh, and whether we whether we do it or not, uh, uh, um, consciously, a lot of us when we write stories, we've got this like embedded in us. Wait, someone's calling me. <laughs>
That's actually my ringtone going off. Oh, well. <laughs> I thought it was Ferris Bueller. Yeah, I know. It is Ferris Bueller. Matthew Broderick's at your door right now. I think it is. I think it is. But, um... He's there along with Selrak. <laughs> it was probably, we're not doing this live, are we? Do you guys see me picking my nose? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't your nose I was worried about you picking. Oh, okay, all right, yeah. Until I start, until you start hearing that music, and then you know I'm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as soon as, as soon as I hear the Ferris Bueller music and a cat meow, and that's about it. You know, <laughs> do but, not um, do black. Well, Roy, what got you started in uh, uh, writing? Have you always wanted to be a, write, a writer? Yeah. Uh, when I was four years old, I took some bond paper and crayons and started writing stories because I would watch cartoons and I would see where they had writers. And I would look in the newspaper and I would see comic strips and I'd see that they had writers. And I'd be, oh, so maybe I should be a writer. And at first, it started off with comics and stories like that. And then when I was about 12, I started reading Stephen King and Michael Crichton, and that turned me towards fiction. And I've been trying to stick with that for the past, uh, what, 20 years? Oh, God, I'm old. You're not that old. (laughs) No way. No way. You can't be over 25. Come on now. Uh, yeah. Now, Roy, you... You're able to do something. Wait, did you just say Al somehow? Yeah, the dog is climbing up up my arm. He's really driving me nuts right now. Is the dog like humping your arm? Have you got a, <laughs> have you, have you got a crochet hook handy? Exactly. That's you know that's the first thing I think of. You know, when I take my dog for a walk, I can tell when she has to do a number two because her tail is up. Like it's afraid to touch her asshole, and then and then it starts winking at me. It's like it's like the poo wants to come out, and um and I and I'm like I know she's getting ready for it. And the dogs dogs have this certain like they they got to get the right spot, you know, they got to get the right place uh, to go. And it's just it's fascinating. I've uh, done hours of research on. on yeah, it sounds like you spent an awful lot of time staring at your dog's balloon knot. <laughs> You're a pretty sick guy, Jay. <laughs> but she's uh, but, well, I, I normally I wouldn't normally I wouldn't do that, but uh, it is a female dog. Uh, but um, <laughs> she's got this. Um, it makes it all right too. She's got this little white spot, and I can't I can't scratch it off, no matter what I do. She's had it ever since she was a little puppy, and I think it was when they uh, when uh, she went to the vet, and they had to shove this thing in her butt to check for worms. And uh, I think that part of that, like, splintered into her butt. And so now that little white spot, it disappears right before she poos. And uh, <laughs> it's just fascinating. I, I don't know if it's every dog. So she has every dog has a white spot. possibly had, like, a splinter for years. I can just imagine, like, your neighbors walking around, and they're just watching you walk with a dog, and they're like, <laughs> hey, Jay, how you doing? And you're like, yeah, I'm not too bad. And, like, what are you doing to your dog? Uh, <laughs> may I return you to a passage in the Bible about the lion and the mouse and the thorn? Yeah, <laughs> same thing. Absolutely, absolutely. But you know, and and it makes it really difficult because she's really she's a she's a small dog. So you know, I'm walking around behind her, all bent up, all hunched over, and everything. You know, and staring right. In. Right, and my glasses, you know, are I need to get some uh, new glasses, so I'm like three inches away from her butt, and you know, because I can see, and it just makes for makes for interesting uh, walks, and it's, it's good for exercise too. Yeah, uh-huh. can you remember but the anyway. first time you saw a pair of dogs going out in the park? Yes, the first time I ever saw two dogs going at it. One was uh, the the uh, the doer. Was a big dog and the little and the the, the Dewey was a little dog, and it, I marveled at that. I'm like, how does that work? How did it was like a Chihuahua and a Great Dane or something, or maybe it was like over the years, you know, the dogs have gotten bigger and smaller. You know, I see, I've seen I've seen something similar, um, <clears throat> but I mean, the first time I actually saw it, I was I was like walking my dog with uh, my mum, 
and I just saw these two dogs going at it, and I was like, Mom, he's hurting the other dog. And she was like, yeah, uh, what they're actually <laughs> doing is, uh, it's, it's nothing bad. I mean, they're dancing. Oh, okay. Yeah, that didn't go down too well at the next school disco, but, um, <laughs> during the, I think um, it was a whole new term, the dirty dance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Patrick Swayze would be proud. High five. Spirit. But I thought dirty. I thought dirty dancing was you just don't take a shower a week before the dance. Uh, no, that's 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 stanky dancing. Stan- like, <laughs> that's the, the, stank- the stanky leg. Yeah, stank is like this the smell of like dancing and sex. Some people say it's a good stank. <laughs> Me personally, I just think you know it's a stank. It's not a good stank. It's a stink. It's a smell. It's a, <laughs> a terrible odor. But uh, back to the subject. Cause obviously, this is a very serious matter we're discussing of uh, different sized dogs. Uh, one of my neighbors. Yeah, I was just talking. I was talking about. I want to get the record straight. I was just talking about dog shit. All right. And you went <laughs> up on the whole dog sex thing. Everybody yeah. knows I'm a cat man dude. Yeah, so exactly. Out of my expertise. Yeah, cat man dude, doggy don't. But um, I was uh, looking after my neighbour's dogs uh, where I used to live, and they were they were like on holiday for Spain for a couple of weeks, and so I had to go over there and take the dogs for walks and like feed the other animals. They had like parrots and stuff. And uh, anyway, I walked in and uh, they had a Yorkshire Terrier, which was this tiny little dog, and it was on heat. And they have another dog that was, uh, he, he was slightly, he was a slightly demented, uh, Dalmatian. And, uh, you could just see him. He's got this poor little Yorkshire Terrier, like, wrapped up in his front paws. And he's dragging her backwards and forwards <laughs> across the floor, but he's getting nowhere near her. And you just, you, you, you kind of have to feel for the dog. Anyway, so I'm, I'm outside in the back garden, and, uh, I, I was putting back some of the, uh, the dog food which was kept in the shed. And I walk in and uh, sat on the armchair is the Yorkshire Terrier and the dog's got its paws, like the Dalmatian, his name is Peter, had his uh, paws on the top of the chair, on the back of the chair. And so it was perfectly, like the dog's head was at crutch level and like the scene that enveloped from there, I I think it's going to scar me. Like whoever says that dogs aren't smart, (laughs) they haven't seen dogs when they really want to go at it. You know, <laughs> well, you know, yeah, really. It's sort of like it's sort of like the scratch and sniff thing. You know, the dogs are like, I know that it's, I know that it's a female dog. I smell it. She wants it, but I can't find it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, actually, I think it. I think it might even be impossible the other way around, though. If the Yorkshire, Yorkshire Terrier was a boy and uh, it was a girl uh, uh, German Shepherd or something, I don't know. That would be the know. most aggressive Yorkshire Terrier you've ever met in your <laughs> life. Where it's just I've constantly, it. it's just always out of reach. You know, I've seen that a Yorkshire Terrier going at it with a bigger dog. That's disturbing. Is that what's going on at the moment? No, no, I've seen it before, not now. Oh, okay. I was going to ask if you had a bigger dog, but. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the big dog of the family. Yeah, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the elf. <laughs> uh, now, I don't know, uh, like I said, I only know about cats, but sometimes when I'm sitting on a couch, my my I'll have my arm down by my side at just the right spot, and my cat, uh, Jack, he will just, I'll just check a bow wow. He'll come over and he'll start... Um, Biting the back of my hand and then trying to climb over my arm to hump me, and oh, nice. uh, and it it's a dry hump and I don't mind it at all because you know it doesn't stain you know it doesn't bother me at all, um, and I just think that maybe when he was a kitten and they fixed him they didn't fix him all the way because you know he he definitely knows there's something going on there's the call of the wild but at I'll the same I'll time because your hand smells of cat sex. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but then you know after after about 30 40 minutes you know he gives up and he goes you know walks away but um but you know, the, the wife will the wife will come in on me and she'll go oh dear god stop that don't let that cat hump your arm i'm like come on look it's not staining my arm at all i, I don't even it's just a little wet you know and, uh, <laughs> yeah as he's applying lipstick to your hand <laughs> no, um, the so oh, I can hardly that. wait to see the graphics of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'll be lipstick. Don't worry, Rimmel London. But um, yeah. no, um, 
I think some of the like oddest animals in the animal kingdom are birds. I mean, I had a friend, uh, the same friend who was looking after his dogs. Like I said, he has he had like parrots and stuff and other exotic birds. And he had this one bird, and uh, his name was uh, I think what was his name? I, I want to say Paulie or something. And he was a love bird, and uh, he never had a mate. But uh, every single day, he'd, like for like an hour straight, he would just be pounding into this piece of rope that like dangled around in his cage, and he'd, <laughs> he'd just be pounding it and pounding it and pounding it to the point where my friend like he felt guilty, you know. He's like, well, obviously this, this obviously he's really lonely, so he went to get him a companion. He, obviously, he, he'd already had a mirror in his cage anyway, so he could watch himself while he's going out with this rope. So I thought that was quite nice. That's like um, Las Vegas sex. Anyway, so uh, he, he's like, well, no, obviously my bird's really lonely, so he's, he's going to go and get it a mate. So he went and got a female companion, and uh, she was there. She was in the cage for about a week. And in this week, the bird paid no attention to her. Like, it got to the point where she'd be, like, shuffling up to him, and he'd be like, well, you know, cut it out. My girlfriend's watching, you know, talking about the piece of rope. <laughs> anyway, um, this one day, I, I don't know what, something must have happened, like some sort of dramatic change in the atmosphere, or uh, one of his many cats surprised him, but his uh, the female lovebird uh, died. And uh, just as my friend went to remove her from the cage, the lovebird swooped down on top of her and just started pile-driving her, and my friend was like, what the hell is wrong with this bird? And I was like, I don't know. Have you been watching anything a little bit risque? And he's like, no, I don't know what's wrong with it, seriously. And I'm like, well, obviously, he doesn't like a challenge. He prefers his uh, objects of affection non-moving. No, there's nothing like bird necrophilia. Oh, no. Oh, why have I got a Woody all of a sudden? I don't know. Oh, yeah. All this talk about nailing dead things, and you just like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and cat sex, and dog sex, and bird necrophilia. Yeah, to be honest, all right. we've taken like, uh, a turn. Why don't we go back on to hating a book? So, uh, uh, Vampire Diaries, is it, have anyone read that um, book series? Not a, no, I want to. I want to go back to dog sex, but no, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, we have to pry you away. What, it's all right. Well, Rory, we, we'll Rory, all right. Rory, you're supposed to top us. What? What can you top us with? Necrophiliac uh, bird sex. What, how can you top that? I can't. So I'm not even going to try. Oh come on! You're sick and twisted. I mean, look at all the look at all the different things you you've written. Uh, uh, Relic, Halloween Tales, Odic Touch. Thirteen tales of the paranormal, one of those being the walk of initiation, and no more room in hell. And you can't come up with something better than bird sex? <laughs> bird necrophilia, no. Oh well, oh, yeah, okay. There's a big. I've, I've been I've been suffering from writer's block lately, guys. So I'm sorry, I can't talk that. What's the world yeah. coming to when you can't think of a story to top a bird having sex with a corpse? <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Roy, have you heard of the Vampire Diaries? I've heard of it, but I don't watch it or read it. Well, I read okay. it first. I mean, my wife, she was she she read the books. Um, to be honest with you, most of my books I read, my wife passes to me. She's like, oh, my God, you have to read this. It's brilliant. And I'm like, okay, yeah, no worries. Let's read this book. And it's part of the reason how I got into writing, in all fairness, because I'd be reading all these books that she'd be recommending to me. And uh, I would be like, I would be like, oh no, they could they could have done that a bit different. She's like, what do you mean? I go, well, they could have done this, and I explained to her like like plot holes and everything else. And she's like, well, fine if you think you can do any better. Well, why don't you write? And I'm like, okay, I will. Hey, there's a big I've, I've been I've been suffering from writer's block lately, guys. So I'm sorry, I can't talk that. Uh, terrible, terrible shame. What's the world yeah. coming to when you can't think of a story to top a bird having sex with a corpse? <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Now, now, Roy, have you heard of the Vampire Diaries? I've heard of it, but I don't watch it or read it. Well, I okay. read it first. I mean, my wife, she was she she read the books. Um, to be honest with you, most of my books I read, my wife passes to me. She's like, "Oh my god, you have to read this. It's brilliant." And I'm like, "Okay, yeah, no worries. Let's read this book." And it's part of the reason how I got into writing, in all fairness, because I'd be reading all these books that she'd be recommending to me, and. Uh, I would be like, I would be like, oh no, they could, they could have done that a bit different. She's like, what do you mean? I go, well, they could have done this, and I explained to her like, like plot holes and everything else. And she's like, well, fine, if you think you can do any better, well, why don't you write? And I'm like, okay, I will. And so I started writing, and uh, I would say I haven't looked back, but uh, 
I'm just looking forward to seeing wh- how I progress as a. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be at the same level. I want to get better. I mean, I, I want to be able to spell. That'd be nice. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's, be. that's why God made spell checker. But <laughs> Leah, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little disturbed that uh, you started out becoming a writer by reading your your wife's material. So I, can I uh, honestly guess that? Uh, here I'm playing Sherlock Holmes. Here, can I uh, deduce that you have read B.C. Andrews? Nope. Okay, so your wife is not the typical woman. All right. Um, how about <laughs> Lady Chatterley's Lover? Nope. How about? Get it I mean, she reads, she reads. She's read like quite a lot of Jane Austen books. Uh, like she was a real big fan of uh, Dilly Court. She, I think she's another English author. Uh, and there's like a few others. I can't remember one of them. There's what this about one book that's written. What about the Bronte? Uh, I think it was. I think one of them was called Leslie, F- not Leslie. F- but there's, I'm sure there's this Leslie woman. I can't remember. It will come to me later on. I'll, you'll be mid conversation. I'll just scream a word at you, and then you just have to <laughs> rewind back. You know, just remember. If I shout random things, it's because the, the, the Pierce. There you go, Leslie Pierce. <laughs> See, I told you. Hey, 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 so that was good. Um, yeah, no, she's like a big fan of quite a lot of them. But, uh, yeah, I mean, th- to be honest with you, um, I tried writing when I was younger, and most of my stories would involve, like, dinosaurs and lasers and monsters, and um, this is, like, all in the same story, and robots and cyborgs and uh, fire, because fire is pretty, and uh, <laughs> being, like, in tra- being trapped in a house or whatever. But I, I never really tried when I was, like, in uh, my high school years. I never really tried to write or anything, and uh, most of my reading, I was obsessed with reading non-fiction books, not biographies, but like testimony and accounts of the paranormal and uh, factual books about like demons and everything else. Cause, I mean, I, I, and uh, as well as, as, I suppose the closest I got to reading fiction really when I was younger was reading a lot about like of uh, like the Golden Bough and old mythologies, like Bullfinch's mythology, which is like a, a brief overview of like some of the great Greek tragedies. And some of the other tales going on, as well as everything like that. It wasn't until uh, my wife weaned me on to some of the non- um, some of the fiction that she was reading, and then I became a bit of a fiction binge reader, and I, th- then I just became obsessed. And uh, I could I could easily read like uh, a six hundred page book in a day if I was uh, if I was really committed to it. And this is this is like whilst I was working as well. Which is quite interesting. Quite an interesting feat. Just it's basically every other word, read a chapter. Every other, which is fun. Yeah, it's, I know. And, and you read the stand in one week. It's unbelievable. To be honest with you, there was there was a couple of times where I, I got pissed off reading the stand. Uh, I shouldn't really say pissed off because there's there's quite an awful lot of scenes in the stand that involves a character urinating. So uh, I suppose a better word would be annoyed or tired, because I thought there was, right. I felt that there was quite a lot of parts in the stand that felt like um, padding, you know, where Stephen King was like yeah. ooing and ahhing where he wanted to go, and so he was just like, well, I'll just keep on writing, and then eventually something will come to me. I mean, I, I, I read, I read something. In the tra- oh, sorry, please go, Roy. Uh, about the stand, every time there was a chapter devoted to Larry Underwood, I got pissed off. I couldn't, I, I couldn't stick with it continuously. I'd have to skip forward a few pages or just give it a rest for a while. Right. I just did not like that character. Baby, do you love your man? Is that what it was? Or yeah. Baby, can you dig your man? Baby, can, can you dig your man? Man, he's a righteous man. Baby, can you dig <laughs> yeah. your man? Yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I didn't mind that, um, Larry Underwood. I mean, admittedly, when it st- he started off and he was like whiny and he was complaining, and he never made it, and it kind of annoyed me that he never really revealed that he was the guy that released that song, because there was a time where, um, I think it was Franny, she was talking about how she liked the song, and I thought, well, this could be a good idea for all the characters to get together, and he could, like, sing or whatever, and, like, bring the community that little bit closer together or something, as they, like, you know, set him up as an icon, as a celebrity from, like, their past life. I thought it could be a quite nice transition, but instead he decides to, like, fade into the background. But uh, no, there was there were some scenes that I didn't really think were necessary. Uh, some of the scenes involving the trash can man, um, because there was just a lot of like rinse and repeats in the same sort of scenarios, where he's fine one minute and to be honest with you, I think it was like the I almost had an epileptic fit reading the trash can man just because his, his emotions were all over the place. 
And it wasn't, oh, yeah. it wasn't so much that like Stephen King was trying to say that he was insane. It was, it came across to me more like it was just that he couldn't decide how he wanted him to be portrayed. Like, uh, he'd be crazy one moment, he'd be talking about burning everything and how he was going to get revenge, and the next scene it would go to the kid, like, sodomizing him with a pistol, and uh, him being terrified for his life, and then it would go back to him thinking, yeah, you're stupid, I'm smarter than you, I've gotten away from you, and then the kid turns up again, and he's like, oh my god, don't rape me. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, that's when he was being bullied. That's right. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it was when he was in that situation. But one of them that I found, like, quite, uh, I think, I think one of the most powerful um, parts in the book was with, uh, I, I forgot his name now. I, I want to say Lance. It wasn't even that long ago, but I forgot. That's not a good thing, is it? But, <laughs> like, what, uh, no, I think it was Lloyd Henry. There you go. He was in prison. And uh, it was before the dark man, uh, Randall Flagg, turned up for him, and he was just starving in there. And it was spread out across, like, chapters. It was, like, broken up with different scenes going on. And I thought it was just absolutely brilliant. And you, you, you were kind of really rooting for the guy, even though he was, like, an evil shit. But yeah. I was still, I thought it was absolutely perfect. So, like, the way it was done, the way he was starving, and he was like, no, I'm not going to be a cannibal, I'm not going to eat rats, that's disgusting. And then eventually, as time went on, he was getting, to more, he was getting more and more desperate. Until the well, that's what had that guy to the roof, you know. Oh, right, yeah, and he cut off his own hand. Yeah. Um, Roy, how did you get started with uh, uh, reading and writing? What what got you started? Well, um, reading, I think, uh, what was the first book I read? It was uh, some of those Sesame Street learning. I had a collection of one to ten of the series. See? They're popular, or were, um, back in the day. <laughs> anyway, I would read those, and then I when pick, I got... I pick my teeth with those books. Oh, I see. What were you were I'm not jealous. A- I started out with C. Dick Run. C. Jane Chase Dick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I'm, I'm sure it was... So, why is Jane running from Dick? Well, when you love someone very much... Well, <laughs> Yeah. C C spot C spot wink C spots winky before he dookies. Yeah. C spot. I'm C-spot. I'm in the wrong line. I got to start writing children's stories. C spot C spot run C spot run to the woman. See the woman get covered in spots. See the woman go to the doctor with the back spots. <laughs> oh wow. See the woman get canister and duo and everything's okay. <laughs> See the woman get shipped to do- to the island of Doctor Moreau. <laughs> so, so Roy, you're talking about the Sesame Street. Yes, yeah, sorry. And then, uh, and then I got into grade school, and I was reading Berenstain Bears and uh, Garfield, and uh, what all else? Uh, Vanicula was a big one, and The Wish Giver. Those were really the books that I cut my teeth on. Okay. Um, Roy, did you ever read a book called The Giver? I know it's reputation, but I have not read it, no. Because I'm, I'm trying desperately to find uh, something that uh, um, that you've read that I've read. Um, um, did you read uh, well, The Devil's book. Arithmetic? <laughs> nope, sorry. Oh. What else is there? That's all there is. That's all the books <laughs> ever written. Summarized in a brief sentence. Well, we were just well, talking about Stephen King's The Stand, and I've read that. So that's one that we what, have in common. What is your, um, what's your favorite Stephen King book, Roy? Hmm. It's a toss-up between It and Salem's Lot. Yeah, I enjoyed It. And, and But, uh, Lee, you haven't read anything except The Stand, have you, by Stephen King? No, I've, I've kind of avoided everything from his. Um, it's mainly because I've... I've, 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 I've I think it was more of an issue with the author. I mean, I'd seen interviews with him and like read reviews by him. And he's just not a very nice person, or at least he doesn't come across as a very nice person. But I suppose you don't have to be when you're as highly acclaimed as Stephen King. And also, right. he's been hit by a van and had his hip broken, and he almost died. So I think he's he's earned his right to be an asshole. At least that's my opinion. 
Hey, I've, um, been, I've been hit by a car a couple of times. I d- <laughs> all right, admittedly, one time it was my fault. Uh, <laughs> I had a, right. I, I was a, I, had a, I had an apprenticeship at a Porsche garage, and uh, one of my my mentor at work, um, he uh, uh, this one day he got into his Porsche and he was like, you know, you, you have to be careful around these vehicles. They cost like thirty grand or whatever, and he's like, well, this one it costs seven grand. Anyway, we got into some sort of discussion or argument, and I was like, you know, you, 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 you talk a big game, but you'd never run me over. And I turned around to like walk across the courtyard, and he jumped in this 968 Club Sport Special Edition, and he just floored it, and he just ran me over. He, like My leg got trapped in the wheel like I must have done about three somersaults before he well, stopped. You deserve he, that. He, he got out, and he yep. slammed the door, and he's like, I fucking warned you, Shrek. I fucking warned you, but you didn't listen. And I'm like, yeah, fair point, you know. <laughs> Medic! But <laughs> yeah, Stephen King didn't do that. I don't I don't think that's what happened, no. No, no, his his was a lot more grumpy. <laughs> although, although he did write about it in Christine. Yeah. Well, also, obviously, in Misery as well. Running up. Yes. Well, I don't know. Well, no, was there a- that's, 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 where he, that's how he wrote it, wasn't it? After, after he got in the accident. He basically, he, I think he wrote Misery, like the idea of being trapped in a hospital bed or whatever, but only it was an hospital bed, it was in a cabin with her. But uh, yes. at the same time as that, um, he, like, he also yeah. had to uh, tell the story of crossing dream catchers as well, yeah. Where he had to, like, regale the event of where he got in the accident and where we're trying to survive with Mr. Grey. The original Mr. Grey before this whole E.L. James stuff went crazy. <laughs> right. Well, Roy, have you ever um, have you ever heard of a uh, um, series, uh, an anime series um, called uh, Death Note? I have. I've seen the movies. Uh, I uh, read the first book in the series, and I watched some of the anime, and uh, it's pretty good. Um, what was the, the name of the beings are called? Ikigami? Is that? Lee, you know about those, don't you? Shinigami. Sh- Death, Shinigami? Yeah. yeah, Shinigami, Death Gods. I, I, I started reading it until, uh, it, that was really my first introduction into that, that whole genre. There, I said it again. <laughs> um, but, um, um, I, I really was getting into it until, started getting so legalistic where it was like you have to do this you got to do that and you can't do that and this is what happens and and uh and then uh, the the uh, uh investigator died and then they had another investigator with the with a letter name or the first one was m and it was l or something yeah and i thought i give up that is just too too much so yeah it was probably a good point to leave it i mean I tried going through Death Note recently, and like everyone's saying, "Oh, if you've watched, if you if you've ever watched anime, you have to watch this." And I was like, "Okay, let's see." And I tried watching it, and I was like, "Yeah, not really digging it." If you haven't seen the yeah. live action movies, though, you should watch them because they're really good. They uh, they take the biggest points of the uh, series, the graphic novels, the the manga series. And uh, it compresses it into two films. They made a third one that shows uh, L's perspective, and uh, they allowed L to win over Light, which I thought was excellent because I didn't like Light that much anyway. Light's the guy that. Uh, oh yeah, Light's the guy that ended up with the Death Note that uh, yeah. was killing all the bad guys, right? Yeah, right. Initially, but, I mean that's that's how the anime ends anyway. Where basically L triumphs over him by proving out. Like uh, there's a scene where he he literally wrote down in the death note how everyone's going to die in a room, but it turned out it was the actual wrong book. I mean, spoiler alert, but I mean it's been out for a few years, like eight, right? <laughs> for the anime anyway, and uh, yeah, no, obviously good triumphs over evil, yay. Although I was like, that's a fairly good yeah. story. I mean, if you want to look at a, an anime with an ending where the guy forces himself to become the bad guy, like as a martyr, in order to uh, like set everything right in the world, it would be uh, what was it? Uh, Codius La Revolution or Chaos or something. It was really quite good. It was, it was it, that was a decent anime. 
Uh, but there's, there's so many out there, like, in regards to decent storylines. I mean, one of the stories I got, uh, I got really into was, uh, Stein's Gate. I don't know if any of you ever watched that. Uh, I, I wouldn't have thought so. But it was all about, um, time travel. And, uh, yeah. it was, it was freaking incredible, to be honest with you. Like, the whole, the way the whole storyline panned out. This guy who basically went around claiming to be a mad professor and he understood, he, he claimed that he understood time travel. When in fact he didn't, he was completely like danced with it, like the entire subject, and uh, he was convinced that everything was a conspiracy, conspiracy that the company were always plotting against them. When uh, and he had like he, he just like they all go on these mad rants and picking up his phone and pretending to talk to someone or like recording a report or something. When in fact he was just generally talking to himself, and he, he ends up getting like a group of people around him. Not so much like-minded individuals, but people that are actually interested in time travel, and they actually discover that uh, from like b- building weird gadgets or whatever, he like connects a cell phone to a microwave, and he, they f- they figure out that they can send like like you couldn't have like eight bits of information back through time to a certain point, so they can like text themselves in a previous state and change the course of the future. And there's like messages like uh, there's this one there's this boy that wants to be a girl in it and uh, they send a text message to the mum saying that you know eat meat not veggies and you'll have a girl you know? <laughs> and so uh, in this in this alternate future the, the only this one guy is anyone that can actually remember the alternate past and um, so he's there in this alternate future and he's like grabbing all of this guy and he's there saying look I don't know what you're talking about he's a boy and everyone's saying don't say that you're going to hurt her feelings and he's yeah. like yeah it's not my fault I'm flat chested and he's like, what are you talking about? You're a boy. You've always been a boy. And he, like, drops his pants. And then he's like, oh, shit. And then, like, everyone beats him up. Because they're, like, saying he's, he's like, trying to rape her. <laughs> like, the ability of sending people back in time. And uh, there's been events that have unfolded in the course of humanity where there have been, like, strange samples found of, like, ooze or whatever, and, like, in the form of people that they thought was... I have got some questions for Roy. Roy, are you ready for the questionnaire? Sure. All right, now, question number one. What would you like inscribed on your headstone or urn? I want my my headstone in the shape of a crocodile, and I want the belly of the crocodile to say, Here lies Roy Hudson. He was delicious. <laughs> okay. Shades of, shades of uh, um, Peter Pan. <laughs> if sort a, of. If there's a ticking clock there, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so you, just I, have, I you just have X underneath it, just from the crocodile. Got him. You know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that would be it. Um, I, I don't think that anyone's ever going to top that answer. Um, <laughs> number number two. What if anything? What if anything terrifies you? Um. Well, I think that. Uh, Religious extremists and, uh, you know, uh, kind of a uh, corrupt government, uh, not to get political or anything, but, you know, uh, people in uh, power, in power uh, forcing certain beliefs and uh, practices, like uh, setting up almost like V for Vendetta, where you've got this totalitarian government that's causing uh, so many problems and forcing uh, and again, like 1984 with Big Brother, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, I read it in 2004 when the Bush administration was in office, and uh, I was like, "Wow, this is this is really creepy." I mean, because some of this stuff is actually happening with the uh, government spying on uh, citizens and things like that. And I was like, "Nah, this is I can't finish this book." So I I haven't read uh, 1984 all the way through, but yeah, that terrifies me. I thought you were going to say uh, a remake or a sequel to the Batman and Robin film with George Clooney and Chris O'Donnell. Oh, God. (laughs) That would be terrifying, too. And it was a a remake of what? Uh, Batman and Robin film with uh, George Clooney and Chris O'Donnell. I think the only saving grace in that film was that you could just watch it to look at Uma Thurman. I think that justifies the film, just so you can just be like, yeah... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I love I love Uma Thurman. Um, yeah. She totally made she totally made Kill Bill. I just absolutely loved it. Yeah. Um, I would have been that orderly, you know. I would have, 
I would have been that early. Um, and we've got another question from our audience. Name something or someone other than your family that you're willing to die for. Hmm. My girlfriend. <laughs> the silence is kind of making me think that that's the wrong answer. <laughs> oh no, there there are no wrong answers. But it's interesting that you said it could be a wrong answer. Yeah, what about oh. you, Phyllis? <laughs> <laughs> we know someone's listening. Yes. Yes she is. Phyllis. Hi guys. Hey, hi. Hey. <laughs> the enthusiasm is overwhelming. <laughs> Oh, yes, <laughs> it's it's kind of awkward, you know. It's a girl. Are you sure? Oh God! Don't don't and put that thought in their heads, no. And if there's uh, if there's the next time there's some silence. <laughs> no, no, no. What you need is um, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a breeze blowing and like a co cooing. And a crow calling, sorry, and like a church bell, just a dong, <laughs> dong. <Yeah>. Just like <laughs> that's what yeah, you're like. Hey, actually, that sounded pretty cool. <laughs> um, here's one. Is that like a techno remix of Mercury Bells? Really? Was yeah. <laughs> that was like a polyphonic <laughs> ringtone. Polyphonic yeah, exactly. Mercury Bells. That's how, this is how you do it. That one's really bad. This is the one. This is the one that I do with my and when I'm bored and I want to scare my animals. <laughs> it drives them nuts. Anyway, <laughs> Roy. I don't know. I thought, I thought we were in a, a sound. <laughs> I thought we were about to get into a war then of different sounds to be played. <laughs> I used to have like a oh, selection of really random ones. Oh, do you have a good one? Oh, you Roy, do you have some good sounds? Uh, not, I don't know this computer, so probably not. Oh, I thought maybe you had a cell phone with all kinds of cool ringtones or something. No, not me. Oh, what do you got? She's got something. Hold on a minute. Wait a minute. Got it. Got to play okay. some. <laughs> Come on, we're waiting. You know, that sounds like it sounds like sex. <laughs> no. Yeah, come on, come on. Oh, she's got Indiana Jones on there. Yeah, the whip cracking. Cracking. <laughs> <laughs> Smoking that crack again, I see. You just break that <laughs> habit. <laughs> well, Lee, what is your... Uh, Lee. Uh, Roy, what is your least favorite type of people, Roy? Least favorite type of people? Uh, I think yeah. I've already covered that. Religious extremists. <laughs> okay. Um, and that and that and those people terrify you as well. Um, yeah. Now, much. what... What writer, Roy, living or dead, would you like to spend an evening with? Unfortunately, uh, I won't be able to do this because he died, but Ray Bradbury would probably be my uh, number one pick. Yeah. Lee, have you read any Ray Bradbury? Uh, no, I don't think I have, actually. I thought I had, but uh, no, I don't think. I've, I've obviously I've heard of Ray Bradbury's theatre, but that's, that's not the same thing. Yeah, Ray Bradbury is just... Uh, uh, an awesome writer. If you ever get a chance, uh, Lee, um, get. Uh, I would recommend The Martian Chronicles of short stories. Um, um, Roy, do you think that would be a good intro book for him, or just jump right into uh, Fahrenheit 351, or is that 451? 451. Uh, or my Fahrenheit. first, my first Ray Bradbury was The Martian Chronicles, but uh, that was not my favorite. After that, I read Something Wicked This Way Comes. And I think that would be more of Lee's alley. Yeah, something wicked this way comes. That would be good. Too. So make a mental note of that, Lee, because it's not just for your reading 
enjoyment is for your children down the road to kind of uh, balance them out from some of these uh, incredibly wicked um, mangas that you've got. <laughs> okay. Thanks for that. Um, Roy, um, what do you consider your greatest challenge in life? Beating writer's block. Are you able to do that, or uh, oh. <laughs> I guess I guess you're I guess you're uh, um, you're facing that. You know um, well, what I found uh, to cure my writer's block, and I really, I mean, I have to admit, I've I've never had it, and I probably will start having it tomorrow. Now that I'm saying this, but um, what I, what I got into the habit of doing. Um, two years ago is I started writing every day, whether I liked it or not. Um, it was like a, a job. I had to sit down and I had to write at least two pages. I had to do two pages of something, whether it was an article or, or a blog post or a story or something. And I made myself do it every day. Every day. And then after a while, it just got easier and easier and easier. And now um, I make sure that I do it first because if I, like, go on Facebook, the day is gone, you know. Um, or uh, if I start uh, reading people's Twitter posts, the half the day is gone. So I have to get my writing out of the way, and then I treat myself to uh, uh, all the great nothingness after afterwards. But... Um, how does your um, uh, writer's block manifest for you, Roy? How does it how does it affect you? Well, uh, hmm. it's been uh, what about five years since I've finished a novel I've started. Last year in November, I uh, for National Novel Writing Month, I started one, and I it's a pattern. I still haven't finished it, and I got to the point where I was stuck. Is it the part where, like, you're stuck where you can't think of anything else to write? Or is it that you've got so many different ideas converging in one location that you can't decide which one to pick? Exactly, the latter. I, I don't know which direction to move in at a certain time, but I know all the different ideas bouncing around in my head. It's it's hard yeah. to keep things straight. Well, I find uh, whenever I'm faced with a situation with, where I'm in writer's block, like in, in that a- a- aspect of like the Three Stooges syndrome, I'm trying to come through at once. <laughs> I find to go medieval on myself is the best way, just doing like some bloodletting, but in a verbal way. So I'll, I'll just try. I'll start writing ideas down on pen and paper, then I'll start looking over the ideas, and I'll be like, right, that's the one I'm going to go with. And then I, I, I switch back onto my laptop and I carry on typing away. And then I end up going with something completely different. <laughs> that's like my way of uh, working through it. But I mean, I, like I said, I don't really have writer's block in the conventional sense. I mean, I've heard people saying when they have writer's block, they, they'll just be stopping and they'll, be, they'll just freeze. And they can't think of what else to write. They find it too difficult or they find it incredibly stressful and they can't, they can't get into the flow of the story or whatever. In which case, they just froze and they just stop and they just leave it. They don't have... What happened there? Yeah, and uh, outlines help for people in that in that area too. Um, what I found that helped me um, is that I committed myself with another person to read or proofread or edit uh, as I went. And being a competitive person by nature, um, uh, if I if left to my own devices, if competing with myself, um, I would always lose. Um, but if I knew someone was counting on me. Uh, to read something or to critique it, um, you know, I just I went ahead because I didn't want to. I didn't want to have to like face them. It's sort of like having the gun to your head type thing, you know. Has um, Roy, um, has, oh, there you go. Is Roy still there, or did he disconnect from the call? Roy, am I back? Am I back? Yeah, you're back. Okay, the network went out on us. I was going to say, I'm pretty sure I heard, like, the sun drop out, and then Jay took over, and I was like, what's going on? (laughs) Well, uh, so uh, to welcome you back, uh, Roy, uh, Lee uh, said something about the Three Stooges. I heard that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Stop it now. Anyway. Um, um, Roy, what would be uh, your weapon of choice 
in the event of a zombie apocalypse? Hmm. Well, uh, I need something that wouldn't run out of bullets. Uh, probably a crowbar because it's got yeah. two different ends. But is that your weapon of choice, Lee? Yes, that's what I said. And then uh, <laughs> my wife, I got I got in an argument with my wife about it. And she was like, "Well, what's the point of having a crowbar if, if you get you know you need to shoot someone?" And I was like, right, well, there's a few problems with that. One of them, you need the bullets. Secondly, depending on what kind of zombie it is, if it makes a loud noise, obviously you're dead um, because you'll be drawing too much attention to yourself and you'll end up getting swarmed, eventually running out of ammo and dying. Um, Another advantage of having a crowbar is not only is it a weapon that you can use uh, to bludgeon or to skewer, but at the same time it's used it's, it's a universal skeleton key, you know? You can you can get into and out of locations as well as get into and out of supplies and prying off doors or whatever, which you don't really get the same sort of thing with uh, using a shotgun without possibly damaging it and rendering it useless. Exactly. Well, that sounds like a good that sounds like a good tool to have. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Roy, what would be your favorite way to die if you had to choose a die? Which would be your favorite way? How about live forever? <laughs> I'd rather not die. Okay, no, that doesn't work. Doesn't work. You got to die, but but you get to choose how you die. What, if, you get, what was you, Batman choking you? Have you ever seen the movie uh, <laughs> Body of Evidence with Madonna or Basic Instinct with Sharon Stone? Something like that. Where I go out having sex. That would be uh, that would be preferable. An ice an ice pick. That's 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 your weapon of choice. Mm, well, maybe after I fall asleep, something like that. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, let's just face it: having having like dying with a serial killer during sex could be one of the worst ways to go. Because just as you're drawing to a climax, they decide I'm going to kill you, so you die unsatisfied. <laughs> you're like, God damn. Well, if I'm dead, I, how would I know I was unsatisfied? You know, everything right. up to that point would be a gas. Yeah, everything after that would be a letdown, though. <laughs> well, if I'm dead, I wouldn't know, right? That's right. Yeah, well, what would, your last thought would be like, why couldn't she give me two more minutes? <laughs> <laughs> your last thought would be, I'm coming. Um, what would be your <laughs> least favorite way to die, Roy? Your least favorite way to die? Burned alive. That's quite a common one, actually. People people say that quite often. Joe said that, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Yeah. Um. That would that it is kind of a horrific way to die. Just um, uh, probably the slow roasted kind would be the worst yeah. way. I yeah, mean, define define when you say burned alive. Define it. Do you mean like uh, severe sunstroke, Hansel and Gretel style, kicked into an oven, tied up at a stake and burnt alive, or uh, a really bad case of the clap? Well, preferably not a really bad case of the clap, but. Also, uh, any type of fire where I'm set on fire, that would be uh, terrible. Um, I saw a TV show called A Thousand Ways to Die, and one of the guy, one of the ways to die was this guy who got dressed up in a, uh, I think it was a, uh, a sea monster outfit or something. It was all, he had created it. It was all uh, uh, foam rubber, poly plastic or something like that. And he wanted to uh, go down into the water and uh, scare people. But by the time he got, he put the suit on, by the time he got um, from his house to the water's edge, um, he was so weak from exhaustion uh, because he had just, he was sweating to death inside the outfit that he died. Uh, He literally, uh, he literally burned alive inside. Slow um, roasted, that's horrible. Isn't, yes. the, isn't the number one way to die in that? It was having sex as well, oddly enough. And it was <laughs> uh, told the story of a, a, a Japanese couple that obviously where they were so old-fashioned that they saved themselves until they were married that on their marriage night they were they decided to <clears throat> to finally consummate it and they both died of heart attack shortly thereafter where they were just so over, overstimulated. Hmm, that's terrible. Yeah, totally. the other, on the other hand, that wouldn't be a bad way to die. Well, it depends. If it, if it was the first time they seen like a naked body, they're like, "What the hell is that?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be. I, I don't know. I think that'd be a horrible way to die, man. I mean, especially if it's your first time. 
Exactly. Worst you know? honeymoon ever. It's like, oh, what's this feeling? What is it? Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> that kind of that kind of puts you off of sex forever. Well, well, well you said that. You said yeah, that, that there's, cool. there's people that are chasing the dragon. You know, you, you hear stories about trying to stop each other's heart while during sex. Chasing the dragon. Yeah, the, you know, looking for that next high. Oh, you mean the auto asphyxiation? The, the not 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 necessarily auto erotic asphyxiation, but I mean it's it's the same it's the same sort of area where people are looking for a, a sexual thrill. They're looking for the next thing. They're bored of the mundane, so they start looking for new avenues. It starts off with role play, uh, then gets into S and M, then gets into you know like attempted murder, <laughs> and it just kind of uh, gets worse from there. But I mean, it's, it's all. I mean, people have different sexual appetites. Anyway, some people they can't get off unless the other person's dressed like a pony or something, you know. Right. I see. Right. Personally, I don't know. Personally, I don't know how a man could have an erection if he's having to rape a woman. I mean, personally, I just don't know how that can happen. I mean, it, it just the whole idea of forcing another person to uh, have sex is it's not a sex thing. It's a power thing. And uh, I just, I, I've never been the type of person where that would get me off. You know, I'd, I'm afraid I'd be the world's the world's worst rapist. Like, okay, I'm going to rape you now, but I need some popsicle sticks, please, and some, some strain, you know. Well, but. you should tell that to the uh, Fifty Shades of Grey fan. Although it doesn't exactly uh, get to the point of rape, but it's all about dominating. And a woman like, oh my god, I'd let him dominate me. And it's like, really? And so you're like, you're an enabler then. That's what you're doing. What you should be doing is nipping it in the bud and said you're enabling. You're an enabler. <laughs> well, Roy, we got one more question for you. And Lee, I like how you asked the question. So I'll let you ask it. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite scary movie? Hmm. Uh, I, I'm. I love the uh, Final Destination franchise, not because it scares me, but because it's a lot of fun to watch. But uh, the scary movie, uh, probably Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. Uh, When I was about 11, I was left home alone on New Year's Eve, and uh, I stayed up late on what we had, uh, Fox 54 Shock Theater. At 1 a.m., I'm watching The Shining, and it gets to the scene where uh, Shelley Duvall is running through the hotel and she's seeing all these ghosts in the rooms, and there's one guy in a dog costume. And I'm I'm frightened that I'm going to run to the bathroom and go past the bedroom and see that guy staring at me in that creepy-ass costume. And I, I waited until someone got home and turned on all the lights, and then I went and took a piss. That's fair enough. <laughs> yeah, actually, actually, that movie still is pretty creepy. I mean, uh, um, I mean, holy smokes! I mean, the guy. I mean, and the, and um, Lee, if you, like, like we know you don't, you haven't read any other Stephen King. I would recommend that you read The Shining. Now, that to me is arguably one of the best pieces that Stephen King did. It was early. It was early work, um, and you can tell that. Uh, when compared with some of his later work, that it wasn't quite as mature. But um, the whole idea of somebody being trapped in uh, uh, in a mansion, you know, like that, and then losing their mind and ended up killing their family, um, that is just it was he he really he really struck a raw nerve into the, the human psyche when he did that and. Uh, as scary as Jack Nicholson and Shelley Duvall made that, um, I think the story was so much better. Um, you know, the whole Catman Scruthers, uh, um, uh, you know, the black guy that came back from vacation and, you know, got a feeling that the kid was in trouble, um, that was really well played out in, in the book. Um, but, uh, and, and so much, so much of a book has to be lost. You know, when you're making a movie because you're dealing with uh, internal dialogue, you're talking about uh, internal images and stuff like that and feelings. But, uh, uh, but yeah, I would recommend that you read The Shining next if you read any Stephen King again. 
I'm going to have to take note of that. I mean, there's been a couple of times where I've been in the library and I've been looking at the book and I'm thinking, I want to, I really want to read this book, but so much of it has probably been ruined for me, like, obviously most of the plot points because of the freaking Simpsons Halloween Treehouse of Horror <laughs> episode. <laughs> you know, when they just try and pave over it. I mean, I've I've watched um, about forty minutes of it whilst it was on TV one night, and uh, I was you know I was, I was really quite indebted into it. But again, I was like, well, I don't want to I don't want to see the ending in case I ever decide to pick it up or just watch it from the beginning because it would just ruin the entire thing. So uh, I think it's one of those things I'm going to have to uh, commit to at some point or the other. But there's no. the ending of the book is much different from the ending of the uh, movie. So, if yeah. you watch the end of the movie, you won't be spoiled to read the end of the book. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. And the, the end of the book was done really... I liked it. I liked the way that the end of the, the book was. Um, right. But, um, but yeah, The Shining, that whole... that whole uh, the, the Roy, I know just what you're talking about as far as... Uh, um, if that's what you're talking about. When, she, uh, when Shelley Duvall realized that her husband had gone crazy and you know when she's at the the head of the stairs you know and you can just see the utter terror on her face and in her eyes and everything and she has what she have an axe or something like that baseball and, and she, a baseball bat and she tried she tried um swinging at him but she didn't even have enough strength to do that you know she was so terrified that she couldn't even get the courage up to to really knock one out of the park, and and then that when she's in the corner of that bathroom and he's hacking into it, you know, he's. I mean, what what what, what do you think of the way that uh, films are portrayed before you see them, like the trailers? How do you think they've progressed as times come on? Hmm. Uh, I think that. Uh Aside from what we talked about earlier with the fan-made trailers, I think uh, that movie trailers have gotten uh, a little bit better lately because it starts with a teaser trailer, and that gets you excited. And then when you actually see the full trailer, uh, there's a little bit more revealed, and it really reels you in, like for Christopher Nolan's Batman movies. You see the (laughs) teaser. What? You see the teaser, and then you're watching it, and then you see the full trailer, and you're all in. And then you go to the movie, and it's uh, it's everything you wanted, you know? What did you think about, uh, have you seen The Dark Knight Rises? I have. What is you, what's, your, what's your opinion? Is it a yay or a nay? Do you, did you think it was a good ending? or? Yay, I, I thought it was a good ending. I did. I, uh, I, I wish there had been more explored into the uh, secondary characters, uh, after, you know, after what was shown at the end of the movie, uh, I was kind of hoping that maybe there was something after the credits to show, uh, what happened. But, uh, since we didn't stay through the credits, cause, you know, we had to go to the bathroom or whatever, uh, yeah, um, I, I felt that it could have used an epilogue more than what was shown in the movie. Okay. But other than that, I thought it was, I thought it was well done. I did think it was a, a fitting ending for the trilogy. What did you think was uh, the best one of the three? The Dark Knight. Dark Knight, yeah, absolutely. The only problem I had with, what well, the only grievance I had with the Dark Knight was uh, where Katie Holmes refused to come back and so they put in Maggie Gyllenhaal. That was that was one of the things that really annoyed me about it because... That's not what I heard. What I heard was Warner Brothers did not ask her to return because of the negative publicity from her marriage with Tom Cruise. That was the story that I heard as to why she was replaced in The Dark Knight. I, was, I thought it was more of a personal choice on her part, which would make sense, because obviously Christopher Nolan was a bit upset with her, I'm guessing, because he's like, yeah, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> 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 this is what I think of you. Look what you made me do. You know, screaming <laughs> like a crazy spouse. This is what you made me do to you. How does it feel? And so obviously he kills her off as soon as possible. Spoiler alert. But um, personally, when I watched um, The Dark Knight Rises, I I really wasn't too blown away with it. I mean, it kind of felt like The Dark Knight, but bigger. So instead of just, like, having uh, him choosing to blow up, well, people choosing, like, one boat dies or the other boat lives or they both die, he does it with, like, the entire city with Bane. And then there was the whole language part and the whole idea of Bane. I mean, 
obviously I, I'd seen some of the animated series and like, some of the graphic novels, and uh, I thought Tom Hardy did a good job to a point where he was, you know, you could see he was masculine, he was a tough guy, he was a badass. He wasn't understandable <laughs> entirely that much. And uh, <laughs> one of the things that put me off most about is he's supposed to be like this sort of big, tough guy, badass, who plucks his eyebrows. And I was just like, right, I, I think it would be better if he had a full on monobrow going on, you know, or like uh, some of the other, like in some of the graphic novels, he's like wearing some sort of mask that makes him look like some sort of reject luchador, in which case I was expect like something like that, but instead he's got this grotesque thing on his face which makes him sound everything is really weird like this, and it's not very really understandable. <laughs> And I was like, it sounds like Sean Connery being choked to death. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it, it, it sounded like he was trying to go out on a high. He was trying to die having sex with himself. Anyway, uh, <laughs> you know, I really wasn't I wasn't too blown away by it. I mean, I really wanted to be. And uh, then, obviously, the introduction to Talia. And I was like, well, in, like Talia, traditionally, she was, you know, obviously Bruce Wayne's lover or whatever, and she was incredibly hot, incredibly sexy. And the character that they had playing now, I was just like, Nope, don't get it. I don't find her attractive. <laughs> and that's like one of the things for me. I mean, fortunately, they did a good job of having Anne Hathaway as Catwoman. And anyone who didn't find her attractive, I mean, Jay, I mean, have you seen The Dark Knight Rises, Jay? Yes, I did. I was. Beyond, uh, did you, did you oh, not blow your top when you saw her? Because she was not only a hot woman, but she was dressed as a cat. That was pretty much everything you looked for. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, I I was looking for. A broom handle, you know. So I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to turn anything. this thing to the biggest crochet hook you've ever seen, girl. The, the second I saw her, I was like... Whee! <laughs> <laughs> Slowly I'm going through all my my tunes tonight. So <laughs> all my sound. Brilliant. Um, but yeah, no. Other than that, I mean, I, th- I wasn't too sure about the whole storyline. Uh, like I said, it was—it just felt like it felt like it was recycled. I mean, I, I still thought it was an okay movie, but I don't think—I think they could have gone with a completely different direction. And uh, well, obviously, they're not—they're not planning on doing any others, and it's upsetting. But I'll get over it. I mean, it, let's face it—it it wasn't the sort of—it uh, wasn't as bad as Batman Forever or Batman and Robin. So I'm pretty sure I, I can live with myself. Well, I think that um, I think that it was meant for the the diehard uh, Dark Knight fan because if you're just a casual Batman fan, um, that movie probably was a little bit too involved. You know, it was like, wow, what's all this, and what are these people doing, and what's that? And um, but if you if you understand it very well, then yeah, you can get uh, well. Like Roy, you, I'm sure you've been reading Dark Knight. Have you been reading? All your, uh, life. Batman, all your life, right? Pretty much, yeah. Well, what did you think of the pit, then? The the pit? Like the Lazarus pit from the... Uh, um... I thought uh, I thought it was pretty well done. I wish that they had gone more into the, uh, the chemical side of it, like uh, in the animated series, and when uh, Denny O'Neill was writing it uh, with... Uh, what they said in the movies, Ra's al Ghul, but when you hear interviews with O'Neill and the other people that worked on the character, and even in the anime series, it's pronounced Ra's al Ghul. Right. Uh, yeah, but um, I thought that they could have gone a little bit more into the uh, myth- mythology of it, but... Uh, I would have been... Yeah, awesome. I would have been happier if they went into the mythological aspects of it as well as the logistical. Because, I mean, they're talking about, like, at, at the beginning, he's, like, walking around, bouncing off this rope, and then he's climbing up. And I was like, well, hang a second, what's the rope attached to? You know, why right. does he just climb all the way up? <laughs> <laughs> Instead, he's just, like, keeps on failing. But it's, like, it's actually attached to a platform, and it's really simple. I mean, at the top, there's a guy from Red Bull waiting there with uh, that... Felix Baumgartner and they're just chilling out. I mean, I don't understand if they had to climb all the way up into the stratosphere. Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't want to climb that rope. But instead, well, you, they're, just, they're having to make the leap of faith. It would seem more like it was a spiritual awakening or a, 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 like a spiritual meaning towards escaping than the actual physical meaning of just climb the fucking rope, you reject. What's wrong with you? <laughs> oh, I know. And, and, you know, I knew nothing about it when I saw it for the first time. You know, when when the the first guy failed, I kind of expected uh, a whole bunch of people to jump out and uh, um, catch him. 
and then carry him, carry him away, you know. Um, Just getting dragged off by midgets, yeah, that's, oh sorry, what's that little people and dwarves, what's the technical term, damn it? Uh, uh, height challenged, little yeah. people. Vertically challenged? No, that's not right. That's what you call a nymphomaniac, isn't it? They can't stand on their feet too long. They have to be in bed. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, I think that, uh, uh, yeah, short people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, back to what I was saying in regards to trailers and TV. There's quite a few films that have been completely ruined by the trailers for me. Um, but that was also being films that I've had to see just because of the trailer, or at the time I didn't realise it was a trailer. Like, have, have, have any of you guys seen the movie The Ring? Yeah. Yes. Well, I didn't realise that The Ring was coming out in the UK, and I was aware of, like, the Japanese release of it, and I didn't realise that they were doing an English remake or American remake. And uh, I just got back in this one night, and I, I, I'd been drinking a lot, and I was pretty much hammered drunk. And so I get in, I lie down in bed, and I turn on the TV, just looking for something to watch while I vegetate myself into a coma. And uh, I turn on the TV, and the first thing that flashes up, it's a blank screen followed by static, followed by the girl coming towards the TV screen, followed by the words, You will die in seven days. And then it just went, it cut out, and I was like, and I'm turning the TV off. Uh, <laughs> and so I was just like, right, I'm, I'm going to take the dog for a walk. You know, I have to try and forget them. And it really screwed me up. And then I was like, oh, right, it's a trailer for a movie. Yeah, that makes sense. But still, seven days later, I was sat in my bed, shitting my pants, thinking it's going to happen. <laughs> She's coming. Oh, no doubt. But, uh, yeah. Well, was... you see, I came, I came in on my own with a movie um, called... Um, here, I'm going brain dead. It's been two hours. Um, it was called Videodrome. Have you all heard of that? I've, yep. I've seen clips and I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. So, I mean, by the yeah, by the time by the time you get into the movie, uh, into the realization that um, about an hour into the movie, that uh, by watching the video, uh, you get this tumor in your brain and it makes you hallucinate and then you die. So you know, you find out an hour after you've started watching this. <laughs> oh, a tumor! Gee, thanks. Why didn't you warn me ahead of time? That's oh, it. If, if you watch this, you're going to get a tumor. I had a similar experience, but I was seven years old and I watched a film called Demons. I don't know if any of you guys ever watched that. It was like a, I think it was an early 80s movie, and it was basically about a group of people that go into a cinema, and whilst in the cinema they're watching a film about a group of people that go into a location, and whilst in this location they find that this sort of artifact or whatever, or they, they start watching this sequence, and then uh, the people start to become possessed by demons, and they start like their skit. They start to rip off their own skin. And suddenly, there's demons killing other people in the cinema, turning other people into demons, and then it starts happening in the cinema as well. And then it was like it implied saying whoever. Like, so basically, what you're saying is anyone who watches this is gonna, you know, have a demon <laughs> kill them. And I was sat there watching this as a seven year old boy, thinking. Like, I turn around and look to my left and there's like uh, my friend and his sister and we're just all watching this film just looking at each other and we're just like right we're all sleeping in separate rooms tonight any of you trying to think fucking funny I'm having you <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no that, that messed me up That's I think that was, that, was, that was one of the few times that I'd watched the film and I'd, I'd then run home like I, he lived like two miles away from where I lived and I ended up running home in like the middle of the night screaming for my mum that was like one of the few times yeah I, I ran really fast as well. I was quite impressed with myself. I was expecting like to pass out halfway, but no, I made it all the way back, and I just come running, rushing through the door, and my mum's like, what, what, "What's wrong? What's wrong?" And I'm like, "Nothing." <laughs> you know, just freaking out as kids do. <laughs> well, that reminds me of the first time I, I saw my parents having sex, but I had nowhere to run. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> your first thing was to jump in the bed. Mummy! Then you're like, hang on a second. Wait. Daddy, yeah. why are you hurting Mummy? It's the same sort of thing. I'm, I'm pretty sure if I would have caught my mum and dad going out, she'd be like, oh, we're just dancing. And then I would have gotten <laughs> probably expelled from my school. And you did say that, that your mother told you about the two dogs. And exactly, exactly. When you got in trouble. Yeah, you got in trouble. We go full circle. Look at that. <laughs> well, speaking of, it's been a couple hours. Roy, is there anything else you want to tell us tonight? I have anything to go to the bathroom, so we need to get this over with. Oh, my God. Okay. Uh, let's see. 
Hold on, give me a couple seconds. Let's see if I've got a sound yeah. for that. I think I do. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> was that a drinking sound? Yeah, that was the drinking sound. It was just me wiggling my tongue. Oh, <laughs> I suppose that Might as well. Like, I suppose that sounds like water sprinkling. No, you can't hear it. Oh, it's Van Halen. Might as well piss. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, yeah. well, have you got any wet, wet, wet? I can see clearly now. Let's <laughs> go. Just go for it. Uh, 16 Lee. weeks, number one in the UK. Lee, you don't have any sounds? Come on, you got to have a sound. you got to have I've, a ringtone I've, or I've, something. I've got, I've got loads of sound effects, but they don't work on this computer at the moment, unfortunately. Womp, womp. Oh, I thought you had like a cell phone or something. Oh, no, well, I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got a mobile phone, which I can, I, I suppose I could put sounds on, but I've got one of those headsets where sometimes we put the... What do you call it? The phone too close to it. it uh, go. Okay, Rory's got to go. Rory, you got to go. Next hey, time, next time it's best independence. That's right. <laughs> had a great time tonight, y'all. Thank you very much. Are you there, Lee? Yeah, I'm still here. I'm, I'm, I'm always here. I'm never far away. Thank <laughs> you live on Skype. Please, someone talk. <laughs> So please, somebody, sir, please talk to me. Roy, it's been a pleasure. Um, you're, I know your bladder is the size of New Jersey now, so you just go ahead. Uh, Phyllis, nice not talking please to you tonight. Me. Please, speak next time. <laughs> okay, I will. It's been an honor and privilege. Take care. Thank you. God bless. Lee, see you later. You too, dude. Take care. Right. Bye-bye. Bye.